I'd just gotten comfy when Teddy started acting up again. It's like the little bugger has a sixth sense for when I'm relaxed. He'd been playing on the carpet with his Kong toy, trying to wrestle the treat out of its rubber casing. But the minute I sank back against the cushion, his head whipped around. A split second later, he was pouring at my legs, trying to get up on the sofa with me. Okay, Teddy, it's okay, mate. Up you come. I hoisted Teddy into the air and plonked him on the cushion beside me. He stared back at me with large, brown eyes, head cocked slightly to one side. Teddy's a Welsh Springer Spaniel. Floppy ears, red and white coat, permanently wagging tail. Cute as hell, in other words. My wife went with my 12-year-old son to visit him, and they didn't even have to convince me to say yes. They just showed me a couple of photos. That was all it took. The thing they didn't tell me, though, the thing they conveniently left out when the idea was first raised, is that puppies are bloody nuts, and Springer Spaniel puppies are really damn nuts. You take your eyes off them for so much as a second, and you will turn back to find them sawing through your furniture with their needle teeth. They're like Jekyll and Hyde in dog form, sweet and loving one moment, bouncing off the walls the next. And, as I'm the only one who's at home during the day, guess who has to pick up the pieces? Right, Teddy, are you going to be a good boy and sit quietly with me for a bit? Teddy's tail started wagging. I ruffled his head and he twisted his neck and nipped me lightly on the wrist. I pulled my hand away and he started yapping, his tail going faster than ever. No, no, no biting. Your dad's watching the news. You want to bite something? Chew your toy. I picked up one of Teddy's dog toys, a stuffed turkey with legs that squeaked, and turned back to the TV. The sound of the presenter's voice washed over me. Now, for the local headlines. A high street restaurant chain has come under the spotlight after reports suggest... Yep, yep, squeak, squeak. The sounds of Teddy playing punctured through the presenter's words. Animal rights groups are putting pressure on police to open investigation after another mutilated cat was found on the doorstep of a... Squeak, yep, squeak, yep. <sighs> I rubbed my eyes and stared at the TV screen, letting the colours wash over me. Finally... A local teenager is making headlines after he developed an app that allows users to... The presenter's voice droned on and on. I felt my eyes drifting shut. I rested my head against my hand, sinking further back into the sofa cushions. And then, quite abruptly, I snapped awake again. Silence in the room. The yapping and the squeaking had stopped. The only sounds now were coming from the TV set. You'd think, for the owner of a dog, just getting to grips with its vocal cords, that silence would be bliss. Nope. Silence is a warning. It's like a giant red klaxon to us. In Teddy's case, it normally means he's wandered off to gnaw something he shouldn't be gnawing, or maybe even to curl down a nice fat turd in the corner of the kitchen. Unless the dog is in your line of sight, and he's fast asleep. Silence means you panic. I raised my head and stared around to the left, in the direction Teddy had been sat wrestling with his turkey a moment before. And as soon as I did, I rolled my eyes. I should have known what he was up to the moment he stopped making any noise. The dumb dog had his head between the sofa cushions again. Teddy was facing the back of the couch body stretched out in a half crouch, head buried up to his ears. A moment later, he began scrambling for purchase with his front paws, trying to dig himself in deeper. Teddy, come on mate. I nudged his body, and was met with a high-pitched, excitable growl. Teddy continued scrambling with his paws, wiggling his shoulders back and forth. I rolled my eyes again. For the past couple of days, this has been Teddy's favourite game. The minute he's up on the couch, he's like a damn ferret down a rabbit hole. Desperate to get in between those cushions. Usually I tell him not to, 
then put him down on the carpet if he keeps it up. I've been telling myself, he probably has the smell of some food that's fallen down there. Before today, before everything had happened, I've been planning to strip this over at some point and dig out whatever had lodged itself in the gap. Looking back now, that thought makes me feel ill. At the time though, it was just another thing on the list of jobs I kept putting off. There had been a lot of those since we'd gotten Teddy. Like I said, I'm the one around during the day. I work from home. But with Teddy, the work aspect has had to take a back seat. Now, as I reached and nudged his body again, and was once more met with a high-pitched growl, I found myself mentally counting down the minutes until my son got home from school, until I can hand the dog over to him. Ben was the main reason we'd gotten Teddy after all. He'd wanted a pet, and we'd wanted to cheer him up, give him something to look forward to when he got him from school. The thing is, ever since the kid left juniors and started at secondary, he's been a bit out of sorts, spending more and more time in his room, not talking as much. My wife was the first one to notice it, and when she pointed it out to me, I told her it was probably just normal 12-year-old kid stuff. But I could tell she was worried. So we decided to do something nice for him, and try and break the cycle with the puppy. But right now, the only thing the puppy was in danger of breaking was the fabric of my sofa cushions. Teddy, that's enough. Hooking a finger around his collar, I tried to tug him back from the gap between the cushions. It was harder than I thought it would be. He's still only little, but he's strong, and he really didn't want to come out. As I pulled, Teddy tensed his body and stiffened his legs. He let out another growl. This one was half muffled. Then he lunged forward, trying his best to pull away from me. Teddy, no! By this point, I'd run out of patience. Twisting in my seat, I reached out with my other hand and scooped Teddy away from the sofa cushions, lifted him up in the air. He struggled in my grip, paused paddling at nothing. If you can't behave yourself, you'll have to go on the floor. I swiveled around and placed him on the carpet in front of me. And that was when I realized he had something in his mouth. Teddy turned to look up at me with his large brown eyes. There was an almost guilty expression on his face. His jaws were shut tight, but I could see a small shape bulging out against his chops. A second later, he was wagging his tail again and padding away from me. Oh, for goodness sake. I braced my hands against the sofa and pushed myself to my feet. Teddy, come here. Teddy trotted across the lounge towards the dining room and I followed. I knew I couldn't let him have whatever he'd found back there. No way. If it was a random object, there was the danger he'd swallow it after all. And even human food can be dodgy for puppies. You have to be really careful what you let them eat. Teddy! Just before he disappeared beneath the dining table, I reached down and got a hand on him. And, just as I did, I heard the back door click open. My son, home from school. Right, what have you got there? Teddy struggled against me, but I held him in place by his collar. Then I reached down with my free hand and got a finger into his mouth. Dad? Dad, you're here? As my son's voice floated through from the kitchen, I located the shape in Teddy's chops. It wasn't what I thought it would be. I could tell that right away. I was expecting to touch something hard. Maybe the plastic coating of some lost toy of my son's, or the crunchy shell of an old biscuit. But the thing in Teddy's mouth was soft. Soft. And hairy. I frowned and hooked my index finger around it for purchase. Dad? In here, mate. Teddy struggled against me once again, but I held him tight. Using my other finger, I pushed his mouth open a little bit wider. Then I used my thumb to get a grip on whatever it was he'd found. 
Come on, Teddy. Let go. Drop it now. Good boy. Drop it. Teddy let out a low growl. My son's footsteps echoed in the hallway. As they drew nearer, I finally worked the object free from Teddy's mouth. And as I stared down at it in my hand, I recoiled. What's going on, Dad? I slipped the thing into my pocket as my son appeared in the dining room doorway. He stared in at me, school rucksack still slung over one shoulder, a disheveled boy with messy brown hair and bags under his eyes. Vaguely, I found myself thinking about how much time he'd been spending alone lately, how often he shut himself away in his room. Yep, yep. Teddy stared up at me, tail wagging. My son's eyes shifted from me to the puppy, and a smile appeared on his face. He's not giving you trouble again, is he? I could feel the thing I'd just pulled out of Teddy's mouth bulging against the material of my jeans. I felt faintly sick. What? No, he's alright, I said. No worse than usual. But at that point, my mouth was on autopilot. My mind was elsewhere. I was thinking about my son, and how the bags under his eyes were getting worse. I was remembering how he told us he'd wanted a pet to play with, and I was thinking of something I'd heard earlier on the news. A headline I'd barely taken in at the time, but which was now ringing in my head like an alarm bell. Mostly though, I was thinking about the thing in my pocket. The thing I'd just pulled from Teddy's mouth. The thing that had been covered in a mixture of dog drool and blood. I was currently soaking through the material of my jeans. Not a discarded biscuit or a long forgotten toy soldier. But the dissected paw of a dead cat. When I was young, my mother taught me that bad experiences, even losing people, can be good for us. With the end of a job, a relationship, or even a life, space is made for a new beginning, like the first sprouts after a wildfire. In the aftermath, you see only destruction all around you. But if you look closer, you'll sometimes find the little blossoms in the ruin. I tried to keep this wisdom in mind when I lost my wife. Vicky and I had been together six years, married for three. Our life was simple. We ran a small business and spent our free time hiking the woods behind our home. She loved spaghetti and painting and back rubs. I loved making her laugh. Then she got sick. We saw every doctor, tried every option. I even started praying again, but nothing could save her. I couldn't save her, and I'd damn near kill myself trying. Toward the end, we'd take little walks on our lawn. She liked the birds that nested there in the tree, and then she was gone. Losing Vicky destroyed me. I lay in bed awake each night, haunted by the silence in our home. I wasn't afraid to fall asleep. I was afraid to wake up and not feel her there beside me. In accordance to Vicky's wishes, I committed her remains to a little plot in the forest. She was big in environmentalism and taught me about green burial. The idea is to have as little impact on the planet as you can when you pass. Coffins of plastic and paint and varnish all over them. That crap gets into the soil and the groundwater. Cremation puts a lot of carbon into the air. But by itself, a dead body is basically plant food. So one night, I set out on what would be our final hike together. I had to carry her in a wheelbarrow, but it still felt a bit like old times. Her presence filled those woods, and I pretended she was walking alongside me. I imagined us holding hands 
listening to the mournful cries of the owls. I didn't bring a flashlight. I knew the way already, and the moonbeams falling here and there lit my path. They looked like a mane of heavenly swords plunging into the darkness, smiting the evil that conquered the forest each night. Vicky would have loved to see them. As we neared the grave, her voice echoed to me on a gust of wind. I tried to ignore it. The gathering fog closed in, forming a barrier of privacy around the little clearing. There was a hole here, and a shovel beside it. Felix, I heard again. My name sounded muffled, as if whispered by a person hiding somewhere in the undergrowth. I looked this time, but saw only a wall of fog, and the gnarled fingers of trees that jutted through it. My heart quickened, and my hands with it. I reached into the wheelbarrow and hoisted Vicky's body out. It dropped to the ground with a dull thud. The voice grew louder, closer. I took the sack off Vicky's head. I wanted to see her face one last time. A single ray of moonlight fell upon her features, bathing her in cold silver. She glowed like an angel. I'll always love you, I said, kissing her forehead. The coldness of her skin bit into my lips. Please, she whispered. She tugged against the rope that bound her arms, but she was too weak from the medication. Somewhere behind us, a score of crows erupted in angry chatter. I buried my knife in her chest, and then buried her body in soil. The earth that swallowed her was cool and wet. Before long, her remains would become the trees and plants that hid us. In that moment, I thought of my mother and the lesson she taught me. I imagined Vicky's body as a seed, and I saw myself a gardener. In time, the forest would reap what I had sown, and new love would bloom in my life. I'm tired of people telling me that real disease is of the body. When my wife was diagnosed with depression, I witnessed the havoc that sickness can wreak on the mind. It ate away at her, made me unrecognizable to her, made me a stranger in her home. I lost her, and I lost myself. Don't let anybody tell you any different. Mental illness is as real as cancer, and it can send a person to an early grave. I've worked at every McDonald's in a 45 mile radius of my house. Somehow, over the years, I've gotten a reputation as a good filler guy. Someone you can call on to deal with sudden absences, firings and unwanted night shifts. And unwanted night shifts. This means I've worked in some truly weird places. But the worst is one by a junction nearby. I've gone there for food dozens of times and it's perfectly normal in the day. But sometimes, I get called in to cover the night shift, and something really messed up is going on for sure. It only happens during the night, as far as I can tell, but it's hard to know. I know night shifts are always lonely, and it's common for there to be rumors, but this place is something else. It's on a motorway junction by a rundown town, Nearby, there's a petrol station that isn't staffed past 11pm, a Starbucks that's never even opened its doors, and a car wash that hasn't opened since the first Toy Story came out. So, come night time, it's just this little glassy McDonald's with happy mascots and bright lights standing like an island of bright fluorescent light in a sea of sepia noir. 
Overhead, you've got a ramp that leads to the motorway. Close by are four dual carriageways that crisscross an enormous roundabout. And between all of that, there are speeding trucks and, well, there's nothing else. No fields, no paths, no pavements, no shops or anything. This isn't a place made for humans. It's made for cars. And I guess that's why the McDonald's survived. Because the through traffic on the drive through keeps it just busy enough to stay open. But at night time, it means there's this horrible atmosphere. Overhead, you can hear the cars zooming by. And there are great big lampposts that bathe everything in amber. And the occasional nighttime traveller driving past. But that's it. I've never worked anywhere so dead. Some night shifts, it's just me. And I gotta be honest, it's terrifying. It's more than just loneliness. It's actually terrifying. There's something out there. It sounds stupid, but there is. The first time I turned up, the manager took me aside and told me I needed to fill a cup up with fat from the fryer and leave it by the open drive through window. I laughed at the time, but he just groaned, grabbed a nearby cup, and filled it up anyway. He put it by the window, and told me I couldn't move it. I was expecting some kind of banter, thinking it was a practical joke, but he didn't even bother. It was like he just couldn't be bothered to explain it, so he just did it himself. That was my first night, and it was a doozy. Nothing happened, not really, but it still messed me up. Over time, customers slowly stopped turning up, staff started going home, and bit by bit, the distant sound of cars died down to only the occasional passing engine. Without ever being fully aware of it, I realized around 2.30am that I was alone. It was a weird feeling to have at work, but I tried to shrug it off, but it was hard. I was standing by the open drive through window, looking out, and I realized I couldn't see anything. It's just this swervy little U-bend, covered by tall hedges, and at night, it gets no light. It was just a black wall of darkness opposite an open window, and I was standing there, facing it, without a single sound except some overhead wires thrumming in the wind and the panicked beat of my own heart. I wanted to reach out and shut the window, or just up and leave, but I also kept reminding myself that I was freaking out for no reason. It was like that all night, me telling myself nothing was wrong, but feeling nervous anyway. As a strategy to stay brave, it worked until I went to the loo, came back, and looked down, only to see that the cup of fat had disappeared. I remember looking up and staring into the darkness, trying to figure out if I was upsetting myself over nothing, or if the cup of fat really had moved. But there was nothing standing outside that window. There was nothing around for miles, and no sound except for the buzz of electrical wires and their reverberations in the wind. For a moment, it felt like the silence and darkness was closing in on me, reaching slowly out of the window and into the restaurant itself. I was on the verge of total panic. When a car took me by surprise and swerved around the corner, rubber tires squealing on the road as it slammed to a stop opposite me. After that, a few drunk guys stayed for about half an hour and must have repeated their order about a dozen times each. By the sixteenth time that I'd been asked to remember dips, I was so angry that I'd forgotten all about the cup of fat. After that, I sort of forgot about my fear. Or at least I got something else to focus my mind on. That was my first night. And when morning came, it all just felt like a bad dream and I was ready to leave it behind me. But that was just the start. Whenever I went back there, I'd fill a cup with fat, and it'd always disappear when I turned my head. I asked around, seeing if it was a prank. 
but people looked at me stupid when I made the suggestion. I took to staying a little longer after the end of each shift, just to go look outside by the window. Most days, I never saw something, but sometimes I'd see bits of the hedge looking broken or busted up. Nothing serious, just a few snapped twigs, but it definitely looked like someone or something big had scraped up against them. Of course, that could easily be a car or a van, so I was never sure. But sometimes, I'd see the odd drop of fat running down the leaves, no more than a small drip. But, enough to tell me, something was out there. It took a while, but I did get my hands on the security tapes for one night. It's such a shame they were terrible quality, showing nothing but me stood in the window, surrounded by total darkness. I couldn't make out much, except for a kind of staticky shadow. On one tape I kept, it looked as though something big might be moving in the darkness, blocking the camera for just a second. But when it passes, the cup of fat is gone. With no tapes, I've had to rely on word of mouth stories, all of which are pretty weird. A while back, a girl supposedly went missing from a shift, but a quick google of her name showed a news story where she'd been killed by violent ex, although no body was found. I spoke to one guy who mentioned a kid finding a nearby drainage ditch filled with hundreds and hundreds of empty McDonald's drinks. I did try looking one day, figuring that might be where the cups of fat went, but never found anything. Then again, it's a nightmare to walk around here, especially in the day, and I can't quite bring myself to abandon my shift and go looking at night. Another story said that it's common knowledge that if a fat fryer is left for long enough, things start to live in it. One day, years back, some new manager finally went in and ordered a new fat fryer, but when they emptied the old one, an ancient piece of kit that I was told had never been cleaned, ever, Something black and slimy was left at the bottom, caked in fat, and looking like no animal or thing anyone had ever seen. When no one was looking, this thing slipped away, leaving a trail of fat between the restaurant and a nearby sewage drain. I did mention this story to one manager, and he pulled one hell of a face and told me, Yeah, I remember that, but there wasn't anything at the bottom of the fryer. Besides, nothing could have crawled because we tipped it straight into the drain anyway, so there couldn't have been a trail. Which I took to be a reasonable explanation, although someone else told me that particular manager hadn't even been in on that day. But after just a few days of asking around, but after just a few days of asking around, I had enough stories to fill a book and almost all of them conflicted in some way. None of them ever really made much sense to me. In some ways, they felt more like a lazy attempt to fill in the blanks. They were just urban legends, and under other circumstances, they'd just be part of the normal gossip that hangs around the old franchise. Except, something was taking that cup of fat. I tried ignoring it, like everyone told me to, but it felt wrong. In my experience, no one else will go the extra step to look after you, least of all your co-workers. And I know that it's real easy to ignore another person's problems. I was the one by that window, not the manager's. I started doing things to find out more. I tried tying a string around the cup one time, but came back to it rolled up neatly by the window. Another time, I left one empty cup and one full cup only to find both cups gone when I came back. Later that night, the empty one was returned, untouched, outside the front of the restaurant doors. Most of the time, there were these little silly variations, and nothing bad ever happened. Things didn't get real, until, one night, I decided to leave the cup further back from the window, by about ten feet I don't even know what I was expecting. 
I just wanted to try and learn something more, I guess. Something about what was taking the cup. Afterwards, that changed. And while I never saw it, at least not all of it, what I remember has stuck to me like glue. It's the sound it made. The image in my head changes all the time. The details move around and the size and order of events change. But the sound... It's almost like I can still feel it in my teeth. I hear it in radio static or in moments of silence. I remember leaving and coming back to find the cup still there by the door. I couldn't see a thing outside that window. Just a veil of black. But I got the sense something was moving on the other side. When a gust of wind blew in from the outside like an animal's breath, hot and fetid, I realized something was terribly wrong. And then, like a dream, it reached out. It began small, innocuous even. It was just a skinny hand trying to grab a cup. But the skin looked thick and crumpled like the hide of a rhino. And even though the arm was thin, like really bizarrely thin, the hand had these chubby fingers that looked slick to the touch. When it couldn't find the cup, it started to stretch. Something about the movement made a noise that filled the room like nails on a chalkboard. The noise was almost mechanical, like a grinding machine or broken tool. And that arm kept stretching, the bone grinding beneath pale, inhuman flesh as it telescoped towards me, stretched, revealing blue, spidery veins that looked close to snapping under tension. One foot, two foot, three, and soon much more. By the time I realized it was going to reach me, I had to suppress a scream. My imagination was filled with images of me being dragged into the darkness beyond, but no matter what I told my legs to do, they just wouldn't obey. Eventually, it reached the counter just beside me and grabbed the cup of fat, before slowly withdrawing back into the darkness. They found me in the disabled bathroom in the morning. I didn't remember going in there, but I do remember waking up in a state of total distress. I opened the door and fled back home, and, as if confirming my suspicions, I later found out my manager didn't say a thing about it to anyone. When I tried getting some CCTV footage of him, he told me it wasn't available. He knew damn well what had happened. It was just another problem to be swept under the rug. No one's been hurt for years. He snapped at me when I finally confronted him in the office. No one's been hurt, he said, almost as if he was reassuring himself. So there's nothing to report. But I wouldn't let it go. In the end, he installed bars on the window. They had a little square we could feed some items through, and they could even be opened from the inside to let us hand out the bigger orders. And then he acted like that was it. Job done. But I remembered that hand stretching out and those bars didn't do much to comfort me. They'd stop a random attacker, sure. But that thing that came out of the darkness? It wasn't enough to get me back on my shift. I only had one left, but I still threatened to quit if they tried to make me do it. I only gave in when the manager himself agreed to sit in on it. After that, I was told I'd never have to work in that branch ever again. Reluctantly, I felt like I had to agree. I didn't want to quit the job completely. It's not a good look to quit a job at McDonald's. It's not like I'm a teenager either. I can't put it down to being young and dumb. It was a tense start to the shift. The manager was mad he had to stay up all night. And I was mad he'd covered up what had happened. So there wasn't much conversation. The only time we interacted was when he placed the cup of fat by the window and then checked the bars. I took the time to tell him he'd have to stay by the window because I sure as hell wouldn't. For a moment, he looked like he was going to try and have a go at me, but I think he realized it was pointless 
and let it go. After all, it was just one more night, right? About half three, I heard a noise from the drive through There was a bang and a loud cry, and I rushed to my feet, heart pounding. I ran around the corner, only to find the manager stood there, swearing loudly, his feet and legs covered in fat. He'd knocked the damn cup over, bang smack straight down his legs and all over his fat stomach. I laughed, which ticked him off, even though I was laughing from a leaf and not actually because he'd messed up. Still, he didn't know that, so he just barked at me to go get another cup. I was filling it up, when this time, I heard another scream. This time I laughed, because I thought he'd fallen over. One false alarm, I thought. No need to rush. I walked, slowly, carefully holding the cup, only to have the manager back up right into me. Another cup of fat ended up tipped all over him, this time down his back. I was getting ready for an earful when he turned, and I saw the look in his eyes, and then that sound came back. I pushed him aside and stared into the room where that hand was reaching out into the restaurant, the arm behind it thinning like gum, being pulled apart. In desperation, the manager grabbed half the empty cup I held and threw it in the direction of the window. It hit the bars with a limp thud before falling to the floor with a hand quick as a whip, followed it down. But by then, the cup was mostly empty, and you could sense the disappointment in the thing's movements. Those lifeless, grey fingers just dabbed at a small pool of fat, flicked to the cup about clumsily, and then snapped back up to face us, like a snake fixing its eyes on a mouse. The manager and I both took a moment to look down at the fat dripping off his legs, and I started to scream for him to take his trousers off. But it was too late. Before he'd even roll them down to his shins, the sound started up again. God, it gets into your head. It hurts just to hear. The poor guy was still trying to pull his fat-soaked trousers off with one hand, even as blood dripped from his ears and his eyes turned red and teary. Realising he wouldn't make it, I grabbed him and started to pull, but we both slipped and fell in the fat. We were both so terrified, we were trying to climb over each other just to get away. If we'd just taken some time, we probably could have escaped, but we were both faced with a kind of nightmare and the idea of that feeling, that cold hand clamped around my leg. It drove into hysterics. I was so scared that when he stopped clamoring over me, I looked around to see that wretched misshapen fist gripping his shin. I secretly felt relieved. And then I felt guilty, even as the thing pulled him backwards with unstoppable strength. I tried to hold onto him, but it just pulled the two of us along as effortlessly as one, and nothing he held onto could stop. When he gripped a nearby grill, the handle he held onto just snapped off, this thing didn't even tug. It was just one long, slow, inescapable drawback towards the window. And then he reached the bars. Open the bars, he screamed. Jesus Christ, open them now, open them now. I stood up and ran forward, trying not to look him in the eyes as I fumbled with the padlock. Where are the keys? I cried, only to turn and find him silent quivering and pale. He was still alive, but no longer able to talk, only whimper. His knee had been forced through the bar. Blood was now running copiously down the metal and onto the countertop. It dragged him through without ever changing speed. Even when it pulled his thigh through, leaving long strips of gourd fat and muscle dangling from the bone, even when I heard the cracks of his shattered bones fill the room, even when it reached his pelvis, his body so twisted that his chin was by his ankle, it never slowed down. It was like paper being fed into a shredder. He lived for so long, 
reaching out onto the counter, trying desperately to stay in one piece. It pulled him all the way through. And what was left on the other side looked like blocks of meat and bone. The last thing I saw was his head starting to crack and crumple, his face pushed together like a squashed tomato, while the skull behind grew elongated and broken. He was long dead by that point, but somehow, he still looked like he was in so much pain. Eventually, something broke inside me, and I ran screaming into the disabled toilets. When morning came, I didn't stick around to find out more. I just ran out the front doors, past the bewildered workers, and fled, ready to never return. Some people cried out after me. I even glimpsed one manager shaking his head by the drive through But, besides an article talking about a depressed McDonald's worker found by the train tracks, I'm not sure I even know what the official outcome was. Sometimes I think it was all a dream. But that couldn't explain what I found on the hood of my car that morning, just before I left. There was a McDonald's cup filled with bloody fat, slick and fluid white globules floating in an oily mixture, mucus-coated capillaries growing dark in the oxygen-rich air as the blood coagulated. I tipped it down a nearby drain, my hand shaking as I approached the grill. That was the last offering I ever gave. I woke up in a daze and found myself staring down the compartment into the faces of half a dozen other passengers. I think the first thing that confused me was that I was facing the wrong way. I really don't like facing the other passengers. Creeps the hell out of me. So many weird expressions and strange looks. The other thing that confused me was the fact that I had no recollection of getting on the train. Some kind of short-term memory lapse? Really rough day at work? I mean, it could happen. I'd be so drained from dealing with asshole customers all day, i just straight up collapse in my seat the moment I sat down. The third thing that really got to me was that I couldn't recognize where the hell the train was heading. Sure, everything would always kind of look sort of familiar, but I don't know. I found the passing scenery to be extremely bleak and nondescript. Just vague silhouettes, barren fields and scattered trees. No landmarks, no buildings, no people. I don't know how long I just sat there, anxiously peering out of the window. I couldn't find it in me to ask anyone either. It's just not socially acceptable. On a train, you should sit silent, isolate yourself, imagine a wall between you and everyone else, never move a muscle unless absolutely necessary. Those are the unspoken rules everyone abides by. I swapped brief glances with other passengers, but I soon had to avert my gaze entirely. It freaked me out even more. It was like their faces was locked in strange unnatural expressions whenever I looked at them, sort of like when you pause a video of someone talking mid-sentence, and when I looked away, then quickly glanced back, the expressions would change ever so slightly. Tickets please, the stern male voice suddenly called right into my ear. I turned, bewildered, to find the conductor standing inches from me, which I found extremely strange since I was situated in the window seat. I'm sorry, I mumbled. I think I got on the wrong train. His head was turned away from me, staring idly down the compartment, and he didn't seem to register a word I said. I kept trying to get his attention by vaguely shifting in my seat, but it was like he didn't really see me. 
like I was invisible to him. Tickets, please, he repeated. Still quite disoriented, I clumsily fished out my phone. I figured I'd just show him my ticket on the app, and he'd be forced to realise I'd somehow stumbled on the wrong train, and let me know how far we were from the next stop. So, you can imagine my surprise when he suddenly yanked a ticket from my one free hand. End of the line, he said, and punched the ticket, before slipping it back between my fingers. I could have sworn the ticket wasn't there seconds before, and I never bought physical tickets anymore. Why bother, right, when you can get them with a single swipe on your phone? I sat there, staring at the thing, desperately trying to make sense of everything. Excuse me, I said. How far is it to the next stop? The conductor was still facing away from me, and I still couldn't tell if he had even heard a word I said. Suddenly, he shuffled rapidly one row down, head still locked in that disturbing position. End of the line, he said, punching another ticket. I sat, frozen, unable to fully fathom what was going on. What were my options here? I really didn't want to interact with anyone else if I could avoid it, but at the same time, I couldn't just sit there pretending I'd magically get home by simply ignoring everything. So, after a few deep breaths, I got up from my seat and nervously approached the elderly couple sitting one row down from me. Sorry to bother you, I said, but you don't happen to... I couldn't finish the sentence. My tongue just stopped working. I think I stumbled back in shock, but I can't be sure. Everything is hazy. All I know is that I felt my heart stop. That's the only way to describe the sensation. Like time just came to an abrupt stop, frozen in that terrible moment of realization. They weren't people. None of them were. Everyone in that carriage. Everyone except the conductor. They were fake. They were cardboard cutouts. Incredibly detailed and lifelike in design, but cardboard nonetheless. I fell back in my seat, mind swirling, heart racing. Every time I blinked, every time I let my gaze wander, the facial expressions on the cutouts would change almost unnoticeably. But they were all variations of the same. Horrible, agonized look. A look of utter dread and horror, of torment and pain. Tickets, please. The fading voice of the conductor echoed. End of the line. It was a dream. A hallucination. Some vivid mushroom trip. It had to be. It couldn't be real. There was no way it was real. I slapped myself, pinched myself, bit myself. Physical pain is supposed to snap you out of it, right? That's what I've been told anyways. But nothing worked. Nothing changed. I was still sitting in my seat, the bleak scenery passing by eerily, the ever-changing tormented visages of the cardboard cutout passengers haunting my peripheral vision, the monotonous voice of that creepy conductor slithering into my ear canals. I was vividly imagining all the horrible ways this could end, death being the only constant, and I soon realized I couldn't sit idly by anymore. I had to do something, get through to someone, and the only other living person besides myself I'd seen so far was the conductor. I tried everything else, calling, texting, messaging, but nothing worked. Or even worse, everything worked. People just didn't answer me. It was like I'd suddenly become invisible. Not physically, but existentially. I got up from my seat, lightheaded and disoriented, edging past my ominous fellow passengers. Their unnerving presence, raising all manner of questions I had no way of answering. I hesitantly approached the conductor, 
swallowing deeply as I tried to figure out exactly what to say. Excuse me, I said, tapping his shoulder gently. Uh, I would like to... Return to your seat, sir, he interrupted. Remain seated until we stop. It's for your own safety. He rapidly snatched and punched tickets as he moved swiftly from seat to seat. Cardboard cutout to cardboard cutout. He would announce their stops loudly, but it was always the same one. End of the line. Now, listen here, I said. I don't know what's going on here, but I can assure you... End of the line, he said again, but this time in a darker, more sinister tone. Remain seated until the end of the line. He turned to face me, and I nearly lost it right then and there. I don't know how I hadn't noticed before. I mean, he looked fairly normal at first glance. Fine blue uniform, healthy skin, a thin, well-kept moustache. But all of that was a half-truth, a half-lie. The other half of his face, the part I hadn't seen until that instant, was blank. Just smooth, featureless skin. No bones, no protrusions. Just a perfectly flat, empty canvas. You can't leave until the end of the line. His half-mouth spoke. I hustled back to my seat, making sure to keep my gaze on anything but the passengers. My heart was racing, and I had this horrible feeling of dread. Life-threatening, all-consuming dread. It was like I had a tumour the size of a basketball in my stomach. A constant tangible, relentless sensation of death. But what could I do? How the hell do you stop a speeding train? There was no way I'd survive jumping out. Even if I had somehow managed to crack open a window, the doors wouldn't budge as long as the train was moving. That much I did know. So, I thought, as I stared directly at the answer, how do I do it? The emergency brakes. It was right there, at the end of the carriage, right next to my seat. I didn't hesitate. For once in my life, I didn't question everything. I just did it. Stood up, grabbed the handle, and pulled it with all my might. I don't know what I was expecting, but it certainly wasn't what happened. I mean, the train stopped, but not gradually. Instantly, from 80 miles per hour to a full stop in half a second. You'd expect me to be thrown halfway through the carriage, right? Slammed into the wall, every bone in my body fractured to tiny pieces. But I wasn't. Didn't even move an inch. Just stood there in wide-eyed shock as the dreary scenery all of a sudden stopped moving. For the second time in my life, I didn't hesitate, didn't pause to consider my options, didn't overanalyze. I bolted to the doors, pulled them open with some effort, and got the hell out of there. End of the line. I heard a chilling voice call as my feet hit the frozen ground outside. I consider myself a level-headed individual. I don't really believe in the paranormal. There's always an explanation some way to rationalize everything. And I've tried. I've tried so hard, but I just can't. I was in the middle of nowhere, slowly backing away from the train. It was cold, freezing, but I hardly even noticed. The conductor was standing in the doorway, his half-faced, hateful demeanor, nothing short of terrifying. He stared at me, as the train suddenly started moving again, gradually this time. End of the line, he just kept repeating. I don't know what it is, but I haven't felt like myself since that day. Like there's a piece of me missing, like I've lost something, and I'm pretty sure I have. I just don't know what. I stared at the train, as it slowly gained speed. 
It wasn't moving on tracks. In fact, it didn't even have wheels. Just carriages scraping against the frozen ground discordantly, leaving no trace as they slowly passed before me. The creepy cardboard passengers harrowing in the window. But there was something else. A new cardboard cutout. My cardboard cutout. I fell to the ground as I saw it. My own horrible, tormented face screaming soundlessly in the window as the last carriage sped past. Eyes bulging, hands clawing at the glass, mouth wide open in a horrible display of fear. Like I said, I know I've lost something. I just wish I knew what. My soul? My mind? And... I would also like to know exactly what is at the end of the line. I was only 12 when my dad started working as a repo man and I thought it was so cool the way he described it made me think he was some sort of mercenary, you know. He sat me down and said to me, Hey buddy, I'm going to work. A guy didn't make his car payments on time, so the dealership is sending me out to take his car away. And being 12, I responded with, Well, did the guy say you could take it? And my dad would chuckle and say, No, no he didn't. But he's a bad guy who won't pay for the thing he bought. So in a way, he's stealing it and thieves are bad, so I'm the good guy, the car sellers are having fixed the problem. Well, as a 12 year old, who was more into Power Rangers, it checked out to me. I did think it was a little weird he would only go to work at night, but if he was taking things from people, it made sense to go when they'd likely be asleep. It was three weeks after he talked to me, that he got badly beat up. My father is a big man. He's 6'5 and 275 pounds. He used to be morbidly obese, had a heart attack, and then decided to get fit as hell and turned into a health nut who can bench twice his body weight. Between his size and his bushy brown and grey beard, bald head and nose ring that made him look like a bull, he was a scary son of a gun. Seeing him sitting in a warm bath, his face smashed into ground beef was jarring. As soon as I entered the bathroom, he looked up at me and smiled, and I could see he was missing a tooth or several. Hey champ, how do you sleep? I couldn't respond, and he nodded. Yeah, it's pretty nasty. The guy last night didn't want to hand over his car. I tried to take it away. Him and his asshole friend decided to come at me with hammers. I'm lucky his girlfriend called the cops, honestly. My mom ran off a couple years after I was born, so it was just me and dad. I did the best I could to help take care of him, getting him food and medicine while he laid in bed recovering. After a few days, he was able to walk around fine, and after a week and a half, he was ready to go back out. The day he left again, I gave him my Power Ranger sword to keep him safe from the bad guys. He laughed a big belly laugh and said, Thank you, buddy. I might need it. After that night, he didn't come home beat up anymore. At least not as bad as before. Every once in a while, there'd be a scratch on his face or a black eye, but nothing debilitating. Naturally, I assumed it was my plastic sword that was responsible for his newfound security. Jeez, I wish it was that simple. Years passed, and my dad kept the job, and it paid well. We ate well, had a nice house, a nice car, and there was a sizable college fund set aside for me. By the time I turned 17, I was working at the car lot my dad repoed for, and all around, it was a good life. One night, my dad asked me if I wanted to ride along with him on a job. Hey buddy, the guy hasn't made his payments in three months, 
The lot is having me go collect. You're a good man now. You want to come? Of course I did. Who wouldn't want to? Obviously, the wide-eyed admiration had died down, slightly, but I still thought the job was awesome. We hopped in the truck my dad used for work, a dirty old 1978 Ford F-150. The drive was pretty long, and we listened to the soundtrack of one of my dad's favourite movies on the way out there. It's some weird sci-fi dystopian thing. I think there's opera in the title. I'm not totally sure. After about an hour, we arrived at the guy's house. An old farmhouse in the woods. The house was a three-story home, with peeling white paint and a covered porch out front. A real dream home for some people. There was also a barn off to one side, with a few cars inside, some in better shape than the others. I could make out the one we were here for, though, sitting just inside. A red Mustang. The dream car of every midlife crisis sufferer. As soon as we pulled up, a man exited the house with a gun in his hand. I tried to duck down, but my dad grabbed me by the wrist. Hey, don't worry about him, bud. We'll be alright. He slid out of the car and I followed, somewhat reluctantly. The man raised his gun, a double-barreled shotgun, and pointed it at my father, who was standing by the truck with his hands up. I took down behind the cab and walked over behind the bed of the truck, peeking out from behind the taillight. Hey, sport, why don't you put that thing down and we can talk like normal people? The man laughed, a harsh bark in the quiet Oregon evening. No way, asshole. I know who you are, and I know that you're here for more than the car. Well, you aren't getting it. You aren't getting anything. He fired the gun, and my dad dug down and charged him. The buckshot shattered the window that was right next to dad's head, and before the man could fire the second shot, he was on the ground, the gun knocked away. Carter, get over here and help me. I ran over to see my dad, punching the man in the face. His nose was bent at a sickening angle, blood pouring down his chin and pulling around his head. Grab me the zip ties from the glove compartment, quickly. Please, this guy's a squirmer. I ran back to the truck and popped open the compartment. It was a Ziploc bag full of zip ties, resting on top of an old menu from a roadside diner we frequented. I grabbed them but as I latched the compartment shut again, I heard my dad swear. I started to move back, but the man had somehow gotten loose from my dad and was pointing his gun at me now. Hey kid, you know what it is your dad does for a living? He was pointing the gun at me, but looking at my dad, who was kneeling, glaring at the armed man. I nodded. He takes cars back from assholes like you who won't pay for them. The man snorted. Whether it was on purpose, or because of the busted schnoz, I wasn't sure. Yeah, not exactly. He does more than take cars, kid. Your dad's a... I dove for the man, keeping my head down, and he turned his head and tried to fire. But I was too quick for him, and my knee connected with his crutch before he could get his shot off. He grunted and fell over again and I jammed my thumb against his nose to make sure he stayed down. He screamed, and my dad came up behind me and patted me on the back. That was stupid, bud. Don't do that again. It'll get you killed. He opened the bag of zip ties and bound the man's hands and feet. The man tried to fight back, but I pinched his nose every time he moved, and eventually he gave up and let it happen. My dad fished around the guy's pockets and found the car keys and tossed them to me. Go pull the car out and park it behind the truck. I'm going to take care of this guy and then we can hitch it up. As I walked towards the barn, I saw a woman peeking out of one of the windows on the side of the house. As soon as she saw me looking, she ducked back behind the curtains. I made a mental note to mention it and pulled the car around incident free. I parked the car behind the Ford as my dad was hoisting the man over his shoulders. Hey, dad, uh, what are you doing with him? 
He turned to look at me, grinning. Well, son, the dealership wants to meet with people who don't think they have to make their payments. They love to hear the explanations, and they usually try and work out some sort of payment plan there too. Oh, okay. Also, I think I saw someone inside the house peeking out from behind the curtains when I was getting the car. Some lady. Dad threw the man into the back of the truck and closed the tailgate. Well, damn. That changes this operation quite a bit, champ. Thanks for letting me know. He opened the truck door and pulled out a tool bag. He opened it up and pulled out a few items. A tow hook, a length of chain, a short pipe, a hammer, a railroad spike, and a handgun. All right, bud. Pick your poison. Dad laughed and walked over to the shotgun the man dropped earlier. He didn't have any ammo on him, but I'm sure there's some in the house. Dad, what do you mean, pick your poison? Well, we've got to bring whoever else is in the house along too. Maybe this lady of his knows something about why the payments have fallen behind. Well, why do you have a gun and a spike? Son, sometimes people try and hurt you for doing the right thing. He gestured with a shotgun. And this is just insurance of a sort. I nodded. Okay, are we going to hurt these people? Well, gee, I sure hope not. But if they make us, I can't say for sure. I'm not going to let anything happen to you. That's my number one concern. I grabbed the hammer. Okay, let's go then. My dad smiled, the moonlight shining in his dark eyes. Your mother would be proud of you, champ. He grabbed the tow hooks, its old tarnished metal rough to the touch, tossed the shotgun and tool bag back in the truck, and we set off towards the house. When we passed the bag of zip ties, he grabbed them and tossed them to me. We'll need to restrain them, just like the guy in the truck. As we approached the front door, I heard a deep voice murmuring softly behind it. Dad heard it too, and smirked. He gestured for me to stand on one side, and he stood in the other, and pushed the door open. A boy, who looked only slightly older than me, jumped out, holding a bat. He yelled and swung as he leapt, but seeing nobody, he stopped. Before he could look to see us, Dad brought the hook down in an overhead strike that caught the boy in the center of the scalp. He cried out and fell to his knees, and I stepped out and swung the hammer. It connected between the boy's eyes, and he fell backwards, blood leaking from his various head wounds. Dad looked down at him, head tilted to one side. Tie his hands, but not his feet. Even if he wakes up at all, he's not going to be walking. I nodded and did as Dad said, pulling the boy out of the doorway so we could close it behind us. We stepped into the foyer and could see into the kitchen, living room, and up a flight of stairs. Dad stepped ahead of me. I'll search upstairs. You said you saw a lady. There's at least one more person, maybe more. You look down here. Yell if you need me. I nodded, and Dad ruffled my hair before going up the stairs. I watched him go and took a deep breath before heading into the living room. You know how old-timey farm families had huge families, like 15 kids or so? Well, I saw a picture on the mantelpiece that made me think we time-traveled. Standing in the back was the man we currently had tied up in our truck, standing next to a woman who looked like she'd be great at peeking out from behind curtains. And all around them were at least 10 kids, including the one we'd incapacitated in the entryway. Dad, you need to see this. No sooner than I yelled for him, I heard a yell behind me. I spun around to see a girl my age running at me, holding a fire poker above her head. I jumped out of the way before she could reach me, but a swing caught me in the ankle as I jumped, and the pain shot through my leg. I landed on the couch 
and the girl turned to come at me again. You hurt my papa, you asshole! She thrusted the poker like a spear, and I shifted in time to avoid being shish kebabbed. I jumped up and swung the hammer, but she ducked and I hit nothing but air. She pulled the poker out of the couch and swung it at me again, and my dodge took me off balance and I fell flat on my ass. The girl was on top of me in an instant, having dropped the poker and pulled a small knife out of the waistline of her pyjamas. I caught a downward stab and was able to hold her hand. I caught a downward stab and was able to hold her hand out of stabbing range, but I couldn't do much to get away. After a few moments in this position, I saw something swing into my field of vision, and the next thing I knew, there was a hook jutting out of the girl's chin, and blood was leaking down into my face. She tried to speak and to pull out the hook, but my dad's hands lifted her by the hook, and she fell silent, her body limp. I scrambled to my feet, too ashamed to even look dad in the eye. I'm, I'm sorry, she just surprised me and... Hey, it's fine. It's your first trip out. Everyone gets caught off guard sometimes. Just try to pay more attention. Now, what were you calling me down here for? I pointed to the family picture. It looks like there's going to be a lot of people around. Dad shook his head. Well, damn. This complicates things quite a bit. I haven't seen anyone upstairs yet, but this isn't a good sign. I'm going to call the dealership and ask for backup. You stay here or search the kitchen. See if you can at least find the wife. He walked to the foyer and pulled out his cell phone, pressed a few buttons and started talking to someone about an extra truck for cargo and about sending another repo man out to help with a load. I picked up my hammer and walked into the kitchen, braced for a fight. Sure enough, the wife from the picture jumped up from behind the counter, holding a frying pan. She was sobbing, barely able to hold the pan on account of her shaking hands. I moved towards her, and she made a half-hearted swing. I grabbed the pan from her hands and turned it back on her, smashing her in the jaw with it. She fell, smacking her head against the tile. No sooner than I set down the pan, a teenage boy ran in, yelling about his mama. He was holding a wrench and swung it into my ribs when he got close. I doubled over, dropping the hammer. He tried to hit me in the head, but I was able to dodge his swing and punch him in the throat. He stumbled backwards, and I grabbed the pan again, swinging it into his nose. He cried out, but he was tougher than his mom, and he shrugged it off. I pulled open a drawer and reached blindly in, and grabbed what turned out to be a turkey baster. Implications aside, that wasn't going to be much help. I threw it at him and reached in again, this time pulling out a rolling pin. That'll do. I swung the pin as the boy approached, and as he ducked, I brought my knee up into his face. His head shot backwards, and blood started to run from his nose. While he was dazed, I swung the pin again, this time connecting. I struck him in the side of the head, and he bounced off the fridge on his way down to the ground beside his mother. I let out a deep breath, letting the pin fall to the floor. I dug down to tie the pair up, binding their hands and feet before pulling them towards the foyer. Dad was still standing there, and he smiled when he saw me. Damn, I'm impressed. Let's get them out to the truck, along with the other two. I've got a co-worker coming out with his van to take care of the rest of them, and then we're going to meet at the dealership. It took two trips to get the family members loaded up. The man who we already loaded up screamed when we loaded the girl from the living room into the truck. He started calling us all sorts of names, even though we only did what we had to for self-defense. We got all the bodies loaded in, and after a few minutes, Dad's co-worker pulled up in his van. He got out, and he had a striking resemblance to Dad. The pair talked for a few minutes, and then the co-worker came over to me. You're Kevin's son. I nodded. He tells me you did a good job in there. Nice work, kid. 
we could always use another NQ Reaper man like us. And it sounds like you've got what it takes. NQ? The co-worker chuckled. No questions. He went back to his van and pulled out a tool bag of his own. I got the rest of this handled, and I'll see you guys back at the dealership. Dad waved to him and watched them go inside. Then he turned to me and put a hand on my shoulder. You okay? I nodded. They were bad people. We did what we had to. They got what they deserved. Dad smiled. I'm glad you understand that. Let's go. Lots of paperwork to fill out when we get back. He hitched the red Mustang up with the grace of a man who's done it a hundred times and we hopped back into the truck and headed back to town. The dealership was situated next to an artificial lake and when we pulled up, the owner, a man who said his name was Dallas but most of his employees called him DM, was waiting for us. DM's height and build were as average as could be but he could charm the slither off a snake, as my grandma used to say. It was good that he was that charming, since his hair had enough goo in it to make any normal person sick. He always kind of overdressed for the job too. He wore the same thing every day. Black suit, black shirt, grey vest, red tie. He smiled wide as the Cheshire Cat when he saw us, and when Dad stepped out of the truck, he yelled out, Kevin! Get a good haul today. Oh yes, boss. A real good one. Want to send someone to get the car? DM nodded and spoke into a radio he always kept strapped to his belt. And you brought young Carter along. How was your first job? I smiled. It was great. We gave the thieves what they deserved, and now they will be punished for it. DM nodded. Glad to see you can see things our way. He looked over at Dad. Kevin, I'll have someone bring a cart for the bodies around. They'll be inspected to see if we can still get a payment plan going for them, or if they're too damaged. Dad nodded. Carter never did this before. He might have hit them in the head a bit too hard for them to be worth anything as is. DM looked at me. Hey, first time, it's no worry. And then to Dad again. Well, we can sell them for scrap in that case. If they're totaled, they aren't totally worthless, right? Both of them laughed as a stainless steel cart was wheeled out to the tailgate. The guy pushing it detached the Mustang and drove it off to the shop. The M led me away from the truck and looked me in the eye. Carter, are you sure you're alright? Do you understand what's going to happen to these people? Trust me, sir. I'd speak up if they didn't deserve this. They made their bed. Now they can lie in it. DM smiled. Glad to hear you think so. He looked back at Dad, loading them onto the cart, and sighed. Next time, though, try to make it so we don't have to scrap so many of them. A few days ago, my five-year-old daughter brought an old, beat-up, purple toy into the house. It had motorized eyes that moved and blinked, a humongous mouth with goofy teeth, and a clear, plastic door on its stomach that you could open and close. I asked my daughter where she got it, and she said she had found it in the middle of the road. After we had a discussion about not going into the road without a grown-up, I took it from her and threw it straight into the garbage bin, since it was probably filthy and full of germs. The next day, I found it in a room. She denied taking it out of the garbage, but I didn't believe her. I chucked it again. That night, me and my wife were woken up by her crying. I went to comfort her. Once I got her to calm down, she started pointing at a closed closet. I looked in it, mostly to humour her. And there, again, was the toy. Again, she denied bringing it inside. 
I took it down, and the more I looked at the toy, the more familiar it seemed to me. It almost felt nostalgic. I had a feeling like I didn't want to throw it away. So, once I put it to bed, I googled it. After about 15 minutes, I found some forum posts from a couple years ago, and after reading them, I promptly took the toy outside, threw it on my grill, bathed it in gasoline, and burnt it until it was nothing but ashes. This is what I found. Found on the What Was That Thing Again forums, post title, Orange Furby Knockoff, posted by user 90skid underscore rts underscore 91 on April 22nd, 2015. When I was about seven, my grandma bought me this neon orange Furby knockoff for me and my cousins to play with. For the life of me, I can't remember what it was called. All I remember is that it was furry. It had a humongous mouth so you could feed it the fake food that it came with. And it had a see-through stomach with a hinge so you could open it and remove the food. I don't think I ever saw any commercials for it or anything. Does anyone know what those things were called? Thanks. Update. From the comments I've been reading, it's good to see that at least a handful of other people beside me seem to remember these things. The general consensus I've been reading is that people remember them as being creepy, or as one commenter put it, effing terrifying. So, I've got to ask, were they really that bad? I don't remember. Anyway, thanks to everyone who is searching for the answer to this fun mystery. Update. Solved. Thanks to user jwilson9891. They are called Gorbos. Here's a description I found on a collector's website. Quote, Gorbos, or in singular, Gorbo, were electronic robot toys produced from 1999 to 2000 by the short-lived Mexico-based company Lester Griffin Toys. They are perhaps most well-known for having large, toothy mouths, motorized wheels in their mouths to allow the Gorbos to pull in or eat toy foods that came with a box, and small, motorized wheels on the base that give the toys limited mobility. Made to capitalize on the success of Furbies, Lester and Griffin had a limited marketing run in which Gorbos were touted as a more affordable alternative. The company was able to produce Gorbos less per unit than Furbies due to their more inexpensive infrared ports and cheaper microprocessors with vastly inferior AI. The Gorbos vocabulary is limited to four words. Hello, eat, follow, and yum. And the microprocessors are limited mostly to processing motion tracking from the infrared port in the eyes, allowing the Gorbo to follow its owner child with its motorized wheels. Though the toy sold moderately in Mexico, Lester Griffin was plagued by bad sales in the United States and was ultimately forced out of business when parents complained that the motorized wheels in the toy's mouths were catching and eating children's hair. There was even a rumor of one child losing a finger but no documentation for this case has been found by this collector. There are also four models in the Gorbo series. Blue, Bipsy, Pink, Momo, Orange, Zangi, and Purple, Festo. I've been looking at pictures, and I guess I can kind of see why some people might have thought these were creepy. The plastic eyes are almost too big, with real looking irises and big eyelashes, and the plastic teeth do look kind of like people teeth. Still, I personally kind of like the design. Super 90s. I'm trying to see if I can order one. I haven't been able to find any on eBay, but I'll keep looking. Update. I was able to track down a toy seller in Mexico that had an in-the-box, never-before-opened Gorbo. It's a Festo, the purple one. Should be here in about a week. Update. I was able to track down a toy seller in Mexico that had an in-the-box, never-before-opened Gorbo. It's a Festo, the purple one. Should be here in about a week. Update. I've been doing some research, and evidently, people still talk about Gorbos in Mexico. 
from what I can tell with my very limited high school Spanish. Some kids thought they were creepy and started calling them Kokoi, which I guess is like a folklore ghost down there that kidnaps children. Small creature, red glowing eyes, hides in closets. How creepy. To be fair though, I heard the same sort of rumors about Furbies on the playground when I was eight. I remember one specific kid swore that a Furby attacked his cousin with an axe. This same kid also insisted that his dad worked at Nintendo, and I should add that I've since looked this kid up on Facebook, and he is now a lawyer. Update The Gorpo should be here in about two days. I know it's kind of weird, but I feel like a kid getting ready for Christmas. I haven't felt this excitement about anything in a long time. It's kind of nice to recapture some of those feelings from when you were a kid, you know? Back when emotions were bigger and deeper and simpler. I miss that. Update The Gorbo was supposed to arrive today, but it hasn't. I've contacted the seller. He swears up and down he sent it when he said he did. Maybe he's having trouble coming through customs? I don't know. Give him my damn toy, Mexico. Update. The Gorbo still hasn't arrived, so I've been busying myself with researching its history. Turns out the factory in Ciudad Juarez that was manufacturing Gorbos underwent a strike in 2000, which contributed to Lester Griffin going out of business. I've tried finding more information, but the factory burned down in 2003 with all its records, so no dice. Update. The good news is the Gorbo arrived. The bad news is, the dealer appears to have lied about it being new. It's all dirty and even damaged. The left eye is completely gone. So, there's only the exposed infrared emitter behind the lid. There's no plastic eye parts in the box, so I know it wasn't damaged in customs. The eyes don't blink at the same time either. Always one, then the other. I think the motor is wearing out too. Every time it moves its eyes or its mouth, there's a super loud cranking sound. Or was it always that way? Even so, I'm still pretty happy. It makes me feel super nostalgic, you know. Kind of makes me think back to when things were simpler. The Gorbo can say, hello, eat and follow just fine. I was expecting a silly kind of voice to match how silly it looks. And I thought I remembered it having a silly voice but I must have remembered wrong. I guess the makers were going for a cute instead of silly, because it basically sounds like a small child when it talks. I guess they got a kid to record the lines. I know people said it was creepy, but now that I've got a real gorbo in my hand, I like it. My son hates it though. He's five. He insists it eats dreams. I've had to move it from the living room to my bedroom because he refuses to be in the same room with it. I don't remember having the same reaction when I was a kid. Maybe you just had to be the right age at the right period of time, you know? Update My son appears to have warmed up to the Gorbo. I found it in his room twice. I even found it hidden under a pile of dirty clothes in the living room when he was watching a movie, so I guess he's playing with it now too. It's good to see your kid liking the same stuff as you. Kind of makes the nostalgia feel deeper. He denies taking it from my room, of course. He even made up a story about it getting into his closet by itself when he woke us up around 2am last night. I just smiled as I took it back to my room. I think he's a little young to be embarrassed by liking the same stuff his dad does. But one day, we'll probably be listening to the same Green Day albums, so I'll give him a pass for now. He insists he hates it. But come on, how can you hate Gorbo? Gorbo still works fine. The thing that's still really impressive to me is how good it is at following. You put it on the ground. You say, follow. You've got to be pretty loud and clear. And then its little wheels start whirring and it follows you. What a cool idea. Update. You know what's annoying? When your kids touch your stuff. I found my son in the garage with a hammer. He was in the middle of trying to smash Gorbo. 
He said it was bad. Said he needed to break it to, quote, help the kids? Neighbor kids? Maybe they didn't like it? Thankfully, most of the damage was superficial. The motor was fine, but he managed to break the only eye. I sent him to his room. The thing cost me 50 bucks, kid. Go break your own damn childhood. Update. I managed to find replacement eyes for Gorbo from a toy part dealer in Canada. So instead of having one broken eye, he now has two whole ones. And, as it turns out, you can mix baking soda and water for a cleaning solvent that won't bleach the fur. My childhood has officially been preserved. I've had to lock Gorbo in my closet. I keep finding him in my son's room, and even once outside in the yard when he was playing. I wanted to have something nice to share with my son, but I guess not. One day, he'll figure out how precious childhood is and stop wasting it. Kids just don't have a sense of value. Update. If anybody in the Denver, Colorado area has seen a five-year-old boy, Caucasian with brown hair, possibly wearing a yellow shirt and blue shorts, please, please, please contact me his father, directly. We love him and miss him very much. He answers to the name of Michael Swenson and might be in possession of a purple Gorbo toy, which, which appears to have gone missing too. My name is Jackson Picard. Have you ever looked at the window of your apartment complex? house or the beach and wondered to yourself what lurks in the deep well i'm here to tell you somewhat to get pleasantries out of the way i'm a professional diver who enjoys diving in the deepest parts of lakes rivers or even the shallower parts of the ocean free diving areas that typically go down to 90 meters at least i used to this dive could have been done with a submersible. I'm sure you'll understand why later. When kids ask divers what their scariest or creepiest stories of the deep are, the divers aren't permitted by the government to tell what they saw. Many of my diver buddies easily agreed that they never wanted to share such stories. I, on the other hand, think everyone deserves to know what is truly out there. I can't tell you the location of where my encounter happened, but I can tell you when. It was the middle of September, I believe the 16th of 2016. This happened to me three years ago, and the experience is still burnt into my memories. I honestly can't even believe I even survived. I won't hold back from this any longer, but please bear with me. This story is hard to tell, and often leaves me traumatized just by remembering it. It all happened so fast. I was sent an email by my government employers to go out to an unmarked location. It was nearly a thousand miles away from any major shipping lanes, and even further from the nearest landmass. I was told to not bring anyone with me on the dive, but when they told me the depth, I could scarcely believe it. 12,000 feet. The deepest dive I've ever done. And they were certain I could do it alone. When I told them I would need a submersible and at least one buddy with me, they actually cut me a break and allowed me to take one person, but no one else. The pay was huge, by the way. This next job would pay enough for me to live comfortably for the rest of my life. It was easily in the eight figures, mind you. I was confused because such a pay is astronomical for one dive and they considered it an appreciation fee. My job was to go down and investigate something. They never told me the details of this something but they just said to dive straight down and we should be there by 3pm. So I called my buddy and told him the job. He couldn't believe it either but he said he'd rig the boat and submersible in three days. He's a rather wealthy professional diver, my trainer in fact, 
who I've been friends with since college. His name is Walsh Gray. It's not a native name because his parents just wanted him to be unique. I find it a cool name personally. When the day came to do the deed, I packed up all my gear, some food to last about three days for me and my partner, and a few distress beacons just to be safe. I hopped into my truck after putting everything in their appropriate places and took the long three-hour trip to the meeting point at the coast where the boat was. While driving down the narrow, bending roads, I couldn't help but feel nervous. I kept contemplating why my employers wanted me to venture into such uncharted territory alone to start with. But even so, at least I wouldn't be going alone after all. It was right at 6am when I arrived on scene with my friend, Walsh. It was still somewhat dark out and quiet, which is how me and my friend liked it. We said our hellos and didn't waste time packing everything into the boat for the trip, locking our doors and such. We had a brief talk about how strange this job was, but it didn't stop us as we have done some crazy things before together. By the time 6.30 rolled around, we were already 15 minutes out. We knew it would take about two days at most to complete the survey mission, since the location was 18 hours out. We had our GPS logged to the exact coordinates my employers gave me. We had a good trip there, filled with chit-chatting, drinking, sharing old stories, and even watching shows every now and then. We had enough gas for five days, so that wasn't an issue. For those of you wondering, we took turns piloting the boat every three hours or so, and we spent minimal time parked asleep between travel time. The boats we were using could easily do 85 miles per hour and was very efficient on fuel. I never told my buddy watch I brought a satellite phone just to be doubly sure we'd be safe. Turns out, we'd need it for sure. The next day, we arrived at the diving location during the middle of the afternoon. Things didn't go according to plan time-wise, but we were still mostly on track. We readied the diving equipment ASAP, along with some food, the emergency beacons, and satellite phone inside the submersible. It was big enough for two people, with an open dome for observational purposes, but it was also very fast with bright lights, and one that can be remote controlled to look around with a camera attached. We anchored to the bottom and hopped into the submersible, and began our descent into the blue void below. A thousand feet, two thousand feet, three thousand feet. It took twenty minutes to reach this level. Outside the dome, we saw strange fish, species we never saw before and it was getting dark, so we took the time to document them as new species and even snapped photographs of them. Discovering new species easily netted a few thousand extra bucks in my work field, so we were happy to make extra money on the dive. 4,000 feet, 7,500 feet, 8,000 feet. At this point, we no longer saw the creatures from before and the only other light beside those on our submersible were those of bioluminescent origins. I never understood how those creatures could survive down here in the dark depths of the ocean. It was downright creepy the way they glided ever so softly around the dome before vanishing into the blackness above us. We continued our descent. 8,500 feet, 10,000 feet, 12,000 feet. We're here. I said, as the bottom came into view. We were traveling slowly at this point to avoid crashing into the sea floor. All right, said Walsh. Let's see what we can find down here, Jack, he murmured, somewhat excitedly. However, his excitement quickly left him when we noticed a submarine of military origin. Our mouths dropped open, not just in shock, but disappointment. As I said, is this why they sent us down here? To investigate some old World War II submarine? I said in an annoyed tone. Walsh, however, wasn't so amused. Let's go around the other side, see what we can find, he said sheepishly. 
to which I agreed with an annoyed expression on my face. We moved cautiously around to the other side, keeping our lights on the submarine. Man, it's huge, isn't it? I said, as Walsh responded in a teaseful tone. What? Never saw a military submarine before? You're such a novice. As I annoyingly humoured his comment, Let's report back. Walsh stopped abruptly, his face turning pale. What? I said, to which he simply pointed to the submarine. I looked at where he was pointing, and my mouth dropped again. But this time, not out of annoyance, but fear. We saw giant claw marks on the side of the 300 foot long submarine. They were massive. One claw mark was easily 60 feet wide, and there were three deep impressions across the sides of the submersible. What, what the hell? What on earth could do such damage? I said, startled at what we were seeing. It, it's gotta be fake. The scale of the creature that did this would have to be monstrous in proportion. I think that was just put here to scare us. Walsh responded back, stuttering. That's when we heard it. A loud, piercing shriek. But it was also guttural and loud enough to shake the ground beneath our submersible. This startled and terrified us out of our skin. But once it stopped, we recomposed ourselves. That, that must be what we were sent to investigate, I said in terror, barely able to stutter the words calmly. Yes, it must be, Walsh said, horrified. But that's when we noticed something. The ocean floor wasn't at its deepest. We turned more to the right and turned on our long-range sonar, to which it illuminated a very deep drop-off that went down 11 miles. A very massive trench, bigger and deeper than even the Mariner Trench. We were both mortified at what we saw, and the sound came from down there. But that wasn't all. We set our lights on a high beam, and in the distance, we saw something we will never forget. A massive creature, easily 500 meters long. Its face was crocodile shaped, with four rows of long, sharp and jagged teeth that glistened in the light of our submersible. Quick, we need to get out of here, now! I said loudly, to which Walsh responded with a full throttle up and out of the region. I quickly turned off the camera as we rose, but I could swear I heard the thing in hot pursuit. And sure enough, it overtook us and locked its massive jaws around the submersible. It began shaking us around and crushing the glass. Our submersible was armed with bright flares, so we fired off a set hurriedly as the bright light stunned the creature and actually caused it pain, enough to release us. Its guttural shrieks were terrifying and horrifying, like a very low, vibrating ice sheet dragging along the seafloor. It was only then that we were released from certain death, but I needed to see exactly what this thing was. I swung the still working remote control light around, and there it was. The creature had a long body, massive and bulky. It was as pale as snow and covered in rigid scales and spikes. Its tail was massive, twice as long as the creature's body, which made up most of its incredible size. The tail was barbed with massive spikes and tendrils, tendrils it no doubt used to drag ships down into the abyss. The scariest part, however, was the eyes. It had so many, all massive and pitch black with massive white pupils. They looked as if they were staring right into my soul. And as the creature left my sight, it let out the most horrifying, guttural roar I have ever heard. A roar that still causes me to wake screaming at night, even to this day. I don't remember much after that. It was all a blur. We were able to make it out by the skin of our teeth. 
The last thing I remember was Walsh dragging me out of the water and leaving behind the damaged submersible as it sunk to the bottom, along with all evidence we had even seen such a creature. I will never forget that monster. It still haunts my memory, even now. I can honestly say that there are things in the ocean that should never be discovered. To all of you aspiring divers out there, never go out to sea, never go diving in the deep, never expose yourself to the horrors of the deep. <laughs>